Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So therefore one needs to look at how these live projects or if not what what is the real in interest of the you know the indigenous people the emergence of this modernity as latour says has been marked by a persistent blindness to connections and hybridity hybridity not only between nature and society but also between the vertical and horizontal threads that make up place so this idea of uh, you know how uh, nature and society has to be looked at or, or 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 this you know the deep divide between this nature, nature and society emerges as a result of this uh, modernity now therefore there has been you know a constant uh, persistent blindness to connections between the two perhaps this is because in the face of this relentless attacks through colonization the process of this assimilation development all put together aim at suppressing the vertical threats sapping their sense of place and identity the live projects are in a way devoted in large part to permanently rebuilding and strengthening those vertical threads now this idea of how uh, nature and society in a way is being located and then uh, all this process of this colonization assimilation and development all tries to you know aims at suppressing the vertical threads that shape their sense of place and identity now in vertical threads it 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 has the indigenous people share some kind of you know uh an idea of how uh this the connections with uh nature now uh, another uh, ecologist that is deborah mcgregor point out that this traditional indigenous knowledge is critical to the indigenous uh people's identity making and also it emerges not only from a history of engagement with the landscape that is uh the vertical threats but also from the struggle that indigenous people sustained with the newcomers that is a, as a result of the uh process of colonization assimilations or maybe as a result of those uh development projects now as uh, deborah had pointed out that this traditional indigenous knowledge uh is critical to you know the identity making uh because these people have you know a history of engagement with the landscape so when there's a you know a forceful intrusion on to, into the you know domain of uh the indigenous people this history of engagement with landscape or the vertical threads which they share uh with the environment or nature in a way is being disturbed and uh affected now she further argues that this framing the indigenous people and their knowledge uh within the dichotomous terms of modernity in a way amounts to losing the richness and complexity of their life projects which also include the ingrained criticism of power asymmetries and the possibilities they can offer uh for their survival for the survival of creation what that is creation again a creation is something how uh they 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 sort of uh you know uh share a holistic uh you know a relationship with their natural surroundings now why is it that there's a 
uh, idea of this the coexistence and politics of resilience uh, from the indigenous people because these life projects are you know in a way pursued as uh, an uphill task where the dominant values of this uh, development and evolutionary progress which are pretty much being supported and then based on the you know uh, the western scientific knowledge all this in a way you know not only block the indigenous people's uh, way but also continuously you know subordinate them now because uh, based on this evolutionary process as we had discussed in the the idea of this the bricolier and the scientists and and how they are in a way being you know uh, subordinated but but as levi strauss has categorically point out that uh, it is only that uh, the way in is they they are in a way you know engaged uh, in their own rightful thinking or in their own uh, ways of thinking so the, the, there's nothing called uh, which of the two is much more progressed or maybe you know advanced but rather it has there it it it, it operationalized in a different setting now this indigenous people struggle against development often uh, involve uh, a resistance that is the idea of a politics of partners its visions that is political horizon its prospects in the face of this development and uh, globalization processes now globally and then even in the indian context for that matter uh, you have you have been familiar with the you know uh, follow up the news when the um, decades of protest against the uh, the server server dam that is the narmada bachao underland which is still very much part uh, and then the dam evictees the adivasi communities are not you know fully compensated the life projects are being affected the life projects are being destroyed and hampered but still uh, despite so much of uh, resistance the government in a way or the you know this dominant values of dom- uh, development which is led by the state are not able to accommodate the needs of those or the plights of those people so one needs to you know locate or situate this process of development not just as simply saying that uh, the marginalized or the you know adivasis have nothing better than to you know come up and then uh, resist what is supposedly being uh, you know understood or considered to be uh, welfare for the state so the idea is uh, as we were saying the adivasis are not against any kind of uh, sort of development for instance but maybe their rightful you know uh, in the domain of those resources are not being recognized so what they ask is to respect their rights on those resources or maybe uh, on the other hand uh, one 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 has to you know do a judicious compensation or maybe the so called rnr policies rehabilitation re- resettlement set uh, policies which are enshrined in the uh, sort of uh, constitutions has to be you know followed and abide by so as pramod prajuli argues that peasants and indigenous people who depend on the maintenance and regeneration of these ecosystems for their livelihood constitute a barrier to the motion of a global capital now therefore there there are so much you know connections and there are so much dependence on the ecosystem that uh, which 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 in a way is seen to be you know Uh, a barrier to the motion of this global capital, which is being guided by you know uh, 
accumulations or exploitations of the resource to meet the present requirements. And then it doesn't have any future scope of the idea of regenerations of ecosystem. It is important for the indigenous people because since they live and rely on it, they believe in uh, uh, reproducing it and then uh, regenerating it. Having to ensure these uh, the symbiotic connections between the human collectivities and the non-human collectivities, they stand in the way of development. Now, uh, the local knowledge in this environmental uh, development uh, discourse uh, also needs to be discussed over here because this local knowledge system have been this uh, subject of uh, an increasing attention, uh, not just uh, you know confined to the anthropologists and environmental researchers and development experts, because uh, local knowledge have been usually portrayed as a part of uh, a romantic past as the major obstacle to development because uh, it, it's not just the life projects or rather the idea of this close connection to ecosystems oftentimes become as a barrier to the development projects. So therefore, uh, this local knowledge which, which have uh, you know, being misrepresented as the romantic past uh, has, has, has always been portrayed as a major obstacle to development, which in a way is a panacea for dealing with not the most environmental problems. That is, according to Poge, this local knowledge has been viewed as practical, collective and strongly rooted in place. So these are partly something which we have already discussed, but as uh, Pose and uh, this Warren has uh, tried to relocate what no local knowledge is in the context of uh, the indigenous peoples and environment development discourse. Now the question is why uh, a sudden interest in indigenous knowledge. Um, why? Because uh, the interest of these outsiders, that is the professionals, that is managers, planners, scientists, policy makers, the, even the decision makers, in this so-called old traditional knowledge is recent and emerged in tandem with the politicization of uh, indigenous groups and the indigenous rights movement. Now. Similarly, uh, therefore, uh, there is this idea of how knowledge is risen and emerged in tandem with the politicization of uh, in, 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 in the recent decades. Many indigenous peoples are today demanding the right to, their right to be heard in the development decisions and this often includes demanding their rights to land and resources be recognized and officially acknowledged. And of late, indigenous knowledge has been, uh, you know, uh, lauded as an alternative collective wisdom uh, relevant to a variety of matters at a time when the existing norms, values and laws are increasingly called into now, therefore, uh, there is an increasing realization that uh, IK, which in a way is perhaps seen to be an alternative uh, as a result of the kind of problems which we are encountering, that is the environmental ecological crisis which we are facing now. Now, as we had also discussed partly how indigenous knowledge is embedded or uh, the life project which are pretty much embedded in land and identity. Now what then, how then is this indigenous people, uh, you know, pretty much the knowledge being, uh, you know, closely related with the land and identity. Because indigenous knowledge comprises the skills and acute 
uh, intelligence which which is responding to the constantly changing social and natural environments now the skills and intelligence uh, in a way also has uh, evolved as as a result of the natural environments so the kind of this adaptable ad or adaptable mechanism is also something which is to be seen in the context of the indigenous uh, technology because uh, perhaps they are the ones who are you know facing the brunt of this climate change the most and uh, they have been you know like evolving themselves and trying to uh, adapt with a kind of uh, this uh, changing natural environment so they in the process they tend to uh, develop certain skills and intelligence uh, as a result of these uh, changes now this beyond pure knowledge it also stretches people's ways of knowing and their experiences sentiments and loyalties of belonging that is their relationship with land so often time the kind of relationship which they share with land is uh, you know seen from the perspective of uh, sustenance or uh, livelihood rather it, it 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 goes beyond that and their connection with the land is something which is to be seen in terms of their cultural identity and uh, their loyalties of not just uh, uh, defending but regenerations of the ecosystem as we were talking about now for the indigenous people this the territories resources and the environment are inextricably uh, linked both spiritually and culturally this inextricable relationship uh, in terms of the spiritual and culturally in short the environment is an essential part of their culture and spirituality now if the question is if uh, uh, the environment happens to also represent these interlinkages of the spiritual and the cultural aspect then the environment becomes sort of a sacred and then something which is uh, seen as uh, you know not from the perspective of exploitation but rather from the ideas of protection right now the biodiversity is more seen from the angle of this uh, spiritual and the cultural thing so therefore that uh, notion of uh, sense of stewardship or being a custodian emerges now how the, how do we understand this uh, in his knowledge uh, in a local context this context is uh, constituted out of these physical facts that is uh, nas in a way talks about the social interactions among people in the surroundings they perceive as their world and spiritual belief and in other words in this knowledge is uh, a human life experience in a particular socio cultural setting of the survival of a community for example indigenous people have uh, you know for centuries maintained a very unique relationship with their environment that is in terms of protection of the environment essential for their food sovereignty and food security now therefore from the western modernist uh, perspective uh, many of these uh, indigenous peoples are seen to be you know living be below poverty or maybe you know they are leading that sort of uh, um, not sufficient enough to have their edible if not from the uh, accumulation of wealth so and so forth but if you look or observe closely since the indigenous peoples economics is mostly guided by you know subsistence 
uh, they don't have the urge to you know accumulate if not engage in uh, uh, storing or engage in cropping system where you have surplus or abundance they they produce things which are adequate for the family and uh, they are being in a way guided by this idea of uh, you know egalitarianism so therefore this idea of uh, you know accumulation of wealth so and so forth is rather something which is not part and parcel of their uh, economic knowledge so therefore as long as they protect the environment, the, the sovereignty of the food is pretty much being secure and they need not worry about other things. So therefore, this, the Western notions of knowledge or economics is something which is different in the context of the, the indigenous people. Now, uh, what are the kind of relationship uh, between this knowledge and land? As we said, knowledge is inseparable from the land. According to the study of uh, regular debt ski, the term land is not uh, restricted to the physical environment only. It has a much more broader meaning used by the indigenous people to refer to the physical biological and spiritual environment which is fused together and the closest scientific equivalent of the land uh, taken without its spiritual component is the ecosystem. Now therefore one can you know look at or locate the kind of relationship which the indigenous people share uh, not I mean the relationship with the land and then the, how this knowledge is being premised in that particular environment. Now, Alfred also states that the indigenous belief uh, usually which is reflecting a spiritual connection with the land established by the creator gives human beings uh, special responsibilities within the area they occupy as indigenous peoples linking them in a natural way to their territories. So therefore, this sort of uh, spiritual connection is being seen even in the works of Alfred, wherein the, how these beliefs are you know, being reflected in terms of their spiritual connection between the two. Now, traditional knowledge again is, uh, you know, more or less based on the practical common sense, good reasoning and logic which are built on experience and which we have already seen in the you know uh, uh, brief explanation given by you know Levi Strauss works on the bricolage on the scientist. The wisdom usually comes in using knowledge and ensuring that it is used in a good way. So knowledge or wisdom is something uh, not used to harm the other, you know, beings. So rather it has to be used in a good way. That is uh, for the prosperity or if not uh, the uh, maintaining some certain kind of uh, a balance. So it involves using the head and the heart together. So most often time, uh, uh, the idea of using arms is to cause a violence uh, rather than being used as a defense. So humans have the tendency of using arms in a more offensive way rather than uh, in a more defensive way. So therefore, we are oftentimes being guided by the head, that is the, the psyche of, you know, dominations, if not harming others, and, and, and not by 
using both the head and the heart. The heart in a way is, uh, you know, pretty much uh, related with the uh, deep connections with shares between not just between human and humans, but also the humans and non-humans of being, you know, uh, caring, nurturing, being emotional, that sort of bonding in a way is being created. So therefore, uh, traditional knowledge is not simply uh, a common sense based on good reasoning and logic built on experience, but it, it also strongly talks about the idea of using the head and the heart together. Now therefore, this traditional knowledge is dynamic yet stable and is usually shared in stories, songs, dance and myths. So this is what Roberts has in a way tries to uh, talk about in the traditional ecological knowledge. Now why is this coexistence again important as we were talking about the differences between uh, the TEK and Western science. From a Western science perspective, this traditional ecological knowledge and sustainable development or sustainability are discrete concepts. Whereas from uh, an Aboriginal or the uh, indigenous people's perspective, they are intimately related and are in fact part of the same continuum or circle. So in a way, it is not something which is seen as uh, a linear concept, but those are seen to be, you know, circle and then uh, which is cyclical. So there is a chain of connection which exists between them. Now, coexistence in a way may serve, uh, you know, uh, potentially promising bridge between uh, the two worldviews. That is, the coexistence approach does not. Uh, devalue Western or indigenous resource managed practices and the knowledge that informs them. Rather, uh, this coexistence between indigenous knowledge and Western science are, you know, to be, you know, bring in together. That is, uh, it, can, it can have this idea or, or this coexistence because coexistence does not allow for the domination of one over the other. So therefore, will there be you know, a possibility of a coexistence between the Western science or the indigenous knowledge? Because both systems are valued and most importantly for Aboriginal people, their cultural survival is assured. Now, I've been trying to inject a uh, you know, few uh, different themes by trying to club together within the indigenous knowledge and traditional ecological knowledge, what we should understand is how this uh, uh, knowledge system is, uh, you know, perceived or to be located uh, in the so-called uh, development discourse. And then how the indigenous people life projects is different, uh, differently to be seen. And is there any possibility of a coexistence between the two? Because coexistence uh, normally talks about, uh, you know, there's no binary and then there's no uh, idea of dominance of one over the other. So there has, there has to be you know, uh, sort of an equal share in terms of uh, this idea of understanding the resources. And I'm sure uh, we have also uh, tried to make sense of what indigenous knowledge and traditional ecological knowledge by the work of mainly Levi Strauss and also others like uh, Deborah McGregor and then uh, Sealands, Mutations and others. So uh, you can have a much more wide understanding uh, by looking at the, uh, by going through these readings and um, partly we have uh, discusses uh, the relationship between this knowledge and natural resource management.